Good morning, Year 10. Uh, welcome to another poetry lesson. I hope you're getting the hang of these now. Um, seeing some lovely work. Keep it coming. I'm rewarding it when it comes, but it's good to see that uh, pretty much all of you are engaging with it. Some of you have gone a bit quiet. Um, if you can get your work to me, then do. Anyway, here's your do now. Write down three quotations from Love After Love. That's the poem that we were looking at before from memory. For at least one of these quotations, do a quotation explosion to explore language and structure devices. And as ever, if you've not managed to learn three by heart, then um, select three now from Love After Love, which is the poem we did uh, yesterday, and uh, put them onto flashcards. All right. Make sure you put the name of the poem in there and what part of the what theme, what part of the theme of the poem they support. Okay. If you don't get that exactly right, don't worry, because we can um, we're good with the flashcards actually, uh, so we can get those sorted when we get back. But get them onto flashcards at the very least, the quotes, and put the name of the poem on there. Anyway, uh, five minutes to do that, then on to the next slide. Here we are. Uh, learning objective is to read and analyse Morning Song by Sylvia Plath. Uh, and the title is Morning Song by Plath. So put that into your books. Today you're going to need all the usual things. A text, I'll attach that to class charts. Um, if you uh, can't print it out, then use the one that's on the, on the slides here. Uh, a pencil for first thoughts and ideas and some different coloured pens or highlighters. OK, as usual, we go straight into the title, Morning Song. What do you think we could work out from this title? What could it be about? What do we associate with the words morning and song? The time between midnight and noon, the dawn, the start of the day, new beginnings, etc. A series of musical, usually musical sounds produced by an animal and especially a bird. You've heard of the dawn chorus, morning song, birds that sing. If you're up that early, you can hear them all welcoming in the day. Uh, what kind of tone are we expecting from a poem with this title? Something hopeful, uplifting, the start of something? Have a think about that, write them into your books and uh, we'll move on to the next slide. That's five minutes for that one. Now, first reading. Um, read along with me and uh, we'll see what you make of this morning song. Love set you going like a fat gold watch. The midwife slapped your foot soles and your bald cry took its place among the elements. Our voices echo, magnifying your arrival, new statue. In a drafty museum, your nakedness shadows our safety. We stand round blankly as walls. I'm no more your mother than the cloud that distills a mirror to reflect its own slow effacement at the wind's hand. All night your moth breath flickers among the, flat, among the flat pink roses. I wait to listen. A far sea moves in my ear. One cry and I stumble from bed, cow heavy and floral in my Victorian nightgown. Your mouth opens clean as a cat's. The window square whitens and swallows its dull stars. And now you try your handful of notes. The clear vowels rise like balloons. Okay, what's going on there then? What's that all about? What is the mood of the poem? Who is speaking? Who are they speaking to? How do they feel? Well, this is a woman who's just given birth to a baby um, in the very early 60s. Um, so I'll give you that, uh, that clue. And what is the mood of the poem? Is this person happy um, that she's given birth to this baby? Is she surprised? Is she uncertain? Does her mood change at all as the poem goes on? Who is speaking? Is it the mother? It is. Who are they speaking to? Well, a com that, it, that um, second person direct address, love set you going like a fat gold watch. She's, um, she's talking to the baby and there is a change later on when it says we, when she's presumably including her husband in that. Um, and how do they feel? I think they feel sort of transported, but at the same time confused and uncertain about their new role. So answer it to the best of your ability those uh, four questions there in full sentences. I'll give you uh, 10 minutes for that. Okay, just to formalise uh, what we're going, you're going to need to copy these notes into your, your books, uh, Year 10. The speaker's voice in this poem is addressing a you from the first line. And we, just, we uh, discussed a moment ago that that was the baby. She's talking to the newborn baby. We know the you is a child. The midwife is our clue to this. There's a sense of the speaker speaking on behalf of someone else at times. We, our. 
However, by stanza three, the first person voice becomes clear and the role is identified. I know more your mother than. So by stanza three, we know it's a mother talking to her newly born child. The speaker is the mother of a new baby. The wee hour they speak on behalf of is presumably the father and both are adjusting to their new roles. Plath was known for confessional poetry and that's poetry that literally confesses the way that you are thinking without dressing it up at all. And this poem is thought to be based on her own experience of being a new mother in 1960. Motherhood in the 1960s was quite different to motherhood today. There was no maternity leave, so women had to resign from their job once they were pregnant. You, that was it. You were out. You know, you, you couldn't get back in again. No one would take you on again. There was more of an expectation for women to stay at home and look after the baby. Um, it, well, it was pretty much the expectation. Gender roles were traditionally defined. Things hadn't really changed much yet. Uh, the poem was seen as a startlingly frank and honest at the time as Plath describes her feelings about her first child. Copy those notes into your books year uh, 10. I'll give you 15 minutes to do that. There's quite a lot there, but make sure you get it in. OK, now we understand the speaker's situation and the tone of the poem. You need to read through it again, this time with pencil in hand and ready, ready to annotate your ideas. So we know that it's a new mother talking to a baby and to a small degree her father um, and I want and we need to identify how she feels about that so she feels let's just say one of the things she feels is uh, uncertain so find a piece of language or a phrase that shows she's uncertain about being a new mother and find a piece of structure that shows that she's uncertain there's a lot of enjambment in this poem enjambment if you remember is when a line flows when a line ends and flows into the next line without punctuation. And it happens between stanzas in this, which is um, quite important. So have a look at where the enjambment goes from one stanza to another and see what that tells us, see what you can see what you can come up with that that tells us about her feelings about her new baby. OK, um, I'll give you uh, 10 minutes to do that. If it takes a bit longer, so be it, year 10. We've got to do it, of course. We're going to go through the poem now and uh, mention some uh, key details that you could annotate. And by annotate, I mean you mark up a copy of your poem you've got with these key, tales, key details. Um, see if you can come up with some ideas of your own about the language and structural choices that, that um, support the fact that uh, Miss Plath, Mrs. Plath rather, is, um, is, the word is ambivalent. She's unsure about this baby when it first arrives. But by the end, she's, um, you know, she's convinced, which is fair enough. OK, you've got some more putting in, writing, copying into your books to do now. There are no clear stanzas in the poem, each of three lines, and yet there is no rhyme scheme or discernible metre. This is what is sometimes called free verse. Um, it means it has no structure. Perhaps this is because motherhood is such a new experience for Plath. She feels her way through the poem, just like she is feeling her way through the experience. It could also say that she feels that she's not fully in control of this new situation and so can't express her thoughts in a controlled way. Write that into your books. And this. Although the poem is called Morning Star, it is not structured like a song and the only connection to singing is in the very last stanza. Although the structure on the page is very three, th free, there is a clear progression through the poem. It starts off with the birth of a baby, of the baby, and shows the strangeness of the experience for Plath. But by the end, the reader feels she has bonded with the child and he even has admiration for her. Copy both of those into your books. I'll give you 10 minutes to do that. OK, here we are. Here's the uh, first three stanzas and the annotations that uh, you need to get on to, into your books, even though I'm pretty certain you won't all understand every aspect of it get it into your books. So love is first word. The child has come from love and this is important. Love set you going. So this is a wanted child. Similarly, the, ba the baby's life is set going like a watch with connotations of the heartbeat and tick sound. Like the watch, the baby is substantial, significant and valuable gold. Among the elements, the element shows that the baby has now become part of the world. It shows the mother's view of the baby's importance. New statue. Language is cold and removed. Statues, drafty museum. The baby becomes like an exib ex exhibit that the parents are staring blankly at, unsure what to do. So at that point, 
she's not as connected as she uh, would like to be to the baby. Uh, the, la the last, the last, sorry, the third stanza there. I'm no more your mother than the cloud that distills a mirror to reflect its own slow effacement at the wind's hand. That's a very complex image that shows the mother is struggling with her new identity here. She doesn't feel like she's her mother. She acknowledges that the child is part of her, the reflection, but also suggests that she is gradually disappearing. Effacement means to wipe away something. The mother feels her own identity has been expunged by the child's birth, perhaps, by, you know, the child arriving has made her identity less important. The eye of the speaker and the role of the mother seem two distinct and discreet things. Complex image, that one, year 10. Just copy it into your books if you're struggling with it. Uh, your, nakes, your nakedness shadows our safety. The baby's vulnerability, shown through its nakedness, casts shadows on the parent's safety. They are fearful. Now they're invested, aren't they? They've got a baby in the world with them. It's not just about them. If something happens to this baby, they will be uh, broken by it. Our voices echo, magnifying your arrival. Echo, magnifying the idea of a baby that can cast shadow on an adult. Again, words that show the scale and significance of the child. You know, these are tiny babies, but they cast enormous shadows. Uh, the midwife slapped your foot soles. This sounds violent, but was a common practice. Midwives would hold the baby upside down to drain lungs of fluid and slap the foot soles to startle the baby into crying and therefore breathing properly. I don't think they do that anymore. They've got lots of equipment to do that. But um, there we are. Get those annotations into your books. OK, and here we are, the last three stanzas. Uh, all night your moth breath, all night shows time passing. It emphasises how there is little time for rest. Now it is just a mother and baby with the mother listening to check the baby is alive throughout the night. The metaphor moth breath shows the fragility of the baby. It suggests delicacy and care needs as the breath flickers. The flat pink roses may be a pattern on the walls, a blanket or a nightgown. They suggest something domestic and homely rather than the museum of the earlier stanza. Remember when she saw the baby as a statue? Now she's seeing it as a possibly something that she could you know, have in her home. Only one cry is needed for the mother to move. She stumbles, perhaps in need or perhaps because her body is still recovering from the birth. The mother describes herself as cow heavy with milk for the child in a Victorian nightgown. These choices perhaps show how she doesn't feel like herself, dressed in an unfamiliar way, feeling like her body is not her own. Whitens and shadows, it's dull stars, and now you try. Try, the child is experimenting with her voice still. Everything is new. The clear vowels rise like balloons. Finally, we get to the song. The mother sees the baby sounds as song-like. Clear vowels help us to imagine the sounds. Balloons associated with joy celebrate at this sound. Uh, whitens, dawn is coming. The night sky disappears. Notice the stars are dull in contrast to the child, perhaps. There's a simile here. Um, your mouth opens clean as a cat's. The child is like a mewing cat now. Animal instinct for food shown. Um, and then uh, that business of listening into the baby's ear and the sound of far away sound. That's like when, I don't know if you've ever done this, but when you go to the seaside and you pick up a seashell and you listen for the sound of the sea in it. There we are. Get those annotations into your books here, 10. Well done. Now, as ever, you need to uh, make some notes. You must shape that your notes you, you sh make sure that your notes include a reference to the speaker and how they feel. We've discussed that. She's a bit confused, but she comes to love her child by the end of the poem. At least three quotations. These are the three that gonna, you're going to use. Some literary terminology, you know, uh, enchantment, simile, metaphor, those things. One point about language and one point about structure that relates to the theme of the poem. And what are what are the themes of this poem? Um, I think change is definitely one. Uh, nature. See if you can pick any others out there. And now you need to learn your three quotes and or put them onto the uh, onto the cards. Well done, Year Ten. Um, keep at it. Keep up the good work. Keep working as hard as you are. Send me the work, and I'll reward you. And uh, I'll see you all soon. <laughs>